Welcome, welcome to this uh, session about running uh, Kafka on uh, Kubernetes. Uh, thank you so much for staying uh, alive because uh, we have like what, like a six different tracks and uh, the sessions are packed with the awesome content. Thank you for being here uh, with me. And uh, a few house, uh, housekeeping items. My name is Victor. Uh, you can always reach out to me at uh, my Twitter. How many of you have a Twitter here? Because it is important. I'm going to be doing some demo stuff, and the Twitter would be a very important thing. There's a few minutes. If you don't have a Twitter, you can go register, go follow me. Because um, a part of me going around and talking to people, talking to developers, and building highly scalable and highly available Hello World applications, um, I, also, um, um, I also like Twitter. And the Twitter is awesome. And um, this is what I do. And we're going to be talking about some, uh, some topics around um, DevOps and uh, how the Kafka uh, will fit in this world. So let me ask a quick question. How many of you start using Kafka already, uh, maybe in some development things, you know, some microservices? How many of you running Kafka in production? Uh, how many of you like managing Kafka yourself on the bare metal or there's some other team that manages for you on the bare metal? Okay, a few people. Uh, anyone using cloud? Any uh, managed service for Kafka? Uh, how many of you using Confluent Cloud? How many of you heard about Confluent Cloud? How many of you heard about Confluent at all? All right, okay, good stuff. Uh, for those of you who don't know uh, what Confluent is, it's a company that uh, we actually have our own distribution of Apache Kafka called Confluent Platform. Um, we do things around um, like support uh, the customers who run the Kafka. We have expertise in uh, professional services. We have uh, people who work with customers. We run probably the best experience on the Kafka in the cloud called uh, Confluent Cloud. And this, this is all relevant. I'm not just bragging about this. So even though sometimes I can, but this is all relevant to this talk. And, um, and the, also we, we sponsor development of open source Apache Kafka. So we, we have uh, engineers who like work like, full time on delivering open source features in Apache Kafka. So this is what we do. Now, when I talk to people, I usually talk into three different, maybe sometimes they kind of like different people interchange their hands, three different personas, three different um, groups of people. I talk to developers. I'm a developer myself. I spent like sort of maybe 10 years in consultancy doing different development work. I speak to operations people. I talk to system administrators, system site reliability engineers about infrastructure and how they can for certain um, automation, how they can do things around Kafka, and sometimes I talk to their <laughs> managers, architects, and things like that. So today, my audience, I hopefully have architects, do have a, oh sorry, operators, like the people who run things uh, themselves, like uh, get their, their hands dirty, right? Uh, developers, do you have a developers here? It's a DevNexus, it's supposed to be developer conference, right? Uh, do you have a managers, people who manage teams, operations teams, it's good, good stuff, all right. Uh, and uh, usually all these groups are going through these cycles or going through this evolution of, you know, bringing certain automations, bringing certain tools, and introducing these tools and using these tools efficiently. So the way how the people start with Kafka, they bring in, um, going to kafka.apache.org, downloading zip uh, or tars files, getting stuff out of it, starting Zookeeper, starting Kafka. They copy the zip file to another server. They start Zookeeper, start Kafka, and so far and so on. This is how you start like a very small project when you try to understand what the hell is going on here, what, how the things are done, and you're learning a little bit yourself. Like if you, um, if you care about how the things will go um, after you leave your developer laptop, so for example, you want to like build another infrastructure, as I say, for, for QA or another infrastructure for pre-production or in production environment, you start thinking how you can automate this process, how you can bring um, some of repetitive uh, deployment practices. Some of the things that you might use, like a Chef, Puppet, Ansible, uh, we provide a kind of like Ansible scripts that uh, they also opinionated, but they allow you to develop and deploy uh, platform 
uh, including Kafka, including connectors and some other things, uh, fairly easy. So this is where, where usually like, things starting uh, get interesting. Um, I'm part of the team called uh, Developer Experience, and we develop a lot of uh, demos. We develop a lot of like, highly scalable and highly available Hello World applications. And for us, we found a way how we can redistribute these demos and redistribute all this dependency. Uh, for us, containers become a, uh, the, the tool of choice how we can you know, do this, this kind of things, like how we distribute our software without worrying about that, oh, someone will you know, mess up with configuration or, or whatnot. So everything would be, um, would be in containers. And actually, it's pretty cool. As a developers, we were promised that like 25 years ago, uh, with Java, you write once and run everywhere. Um, it's a bit of a stretch, like you can say, it's promise was fully fulfilled. But with containers, you actually can run uh, right once and deploy everywhere because um, regardless if you're using Java, if you're using Go, if you're using any different uh, language, you still you know, run a container and you don't necessarily need to know what's inside there. So you know that there's certain rules, how to run this, there's an point, and uh, voila, you have this, this application. Probably, uh, I just realized that maybe I should replace this picture for the next presentation with this kind of like a, uh, how it's called, uh, the, when they have this brain, the, uh, brain mind type of meme, you know, when you're going through this process. Because I guess right now, the higher stage of this evolution, exactly, yes, um, with uh, evolution of uh, DevOps in uh, tooling uh, in the Kafka world would be cloud. So in this case, you will abstract you declare your environment that you want to have a Kafka cluster that will have certain uh, requirements on in messages and certain requirements on out messages, and after that, the cloud will fulfill this. But not all clouds were created equal. Uh, different clouds provide different experience. So um, my colleague, uh, Ricardo, he wrote a blog post about when he was um, breaking down uh, different uh, the aspects of the cloud infrastructure um, without bashing other cloud providers. You know, we, uh, we, 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 we're, good, uh, we're good players here, so we, we're trying to uh, educate people and show that, you know, what kind of pointers you need to look and what kind of pointers uh, you, need to f you can find uh, while using different cloud providers. And one of the things that I personally liked from, from this presentation, from his blog post, is that at this point, when, so it is cloud, right? So we were promised that there would be no servers, there would be no something where we can just define our infrastructure, saying, hey, we want to have this Kafka cluster, and after that, we don't need to think about things like upgrading stuff, um, putting some of the security, uh, security updates, um, so far and so on. So if one of the providers will put enough uh, the <laughs> burden to you to choose, you need to go and choose what kind of uh, version you want to deploy, you need to bring these binaries, you need to choose what kind of instances of uh, your cloud compute engine you need, to, you need to use. All these things are actually um, require some of the knowledge. And I would like you to kind of remember this point. It will require knowledge and experience if you run uh, these uh, complex software products like Kafka uh, by yourself. So this is why I started by um, asking you how many of you actually you know, running things yourself. Because it is important, and this is the uh, most important part from a perspective of how you will um, deploy things like everywhere. So. Um, Close enough. Like sometimes people say, hey, Victor, yeah, the cloud is awesome. But hey, over the years, our organization already bought uh, and built few data centers. We, we, we bought uh, thousands of uh, servers. Like we cannot just throw, throw it away. You know, we need to have a like similar cloud experience, but on-prem. You know, so that's why many organizations, I'm, I'm pretty sure um, many of you working in this organization, you've heard that kind of stuff, like, oh, we're building internal cloud. So we have our internal cloud. So it is different people have a different idea what they put in this like internal cloud. It may be just like a, um, like a compute a cloud, like Amazon that gives you kind of VMs when you run your application, or maybe it's a platform like a cloud fan 
country where you deploy your applications. Um, or maybe something that, like Kubernetes, for example, that allows you to run multiple uh, heterogeneous uh, type of workloads in, in, your, uh, in your internal cloud. And Kubernetes is the closest thing that we have uh, to, to kind of like a true cloud native experience. However, uh, people start looking at Kubernetes from perspective, hey, ah, we want to uh, like save some money on our cloud infrastructure. No. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you, you just like keep, keep uh, bringing more stuff, more workloads, and uh, it's just, uh, you know, this never end the cycle. But hey, the still, you know, the Kubernetes can get, um, makes us get things done. So another very important slide for this presentation is uh, because sometimes people say, oh, Victor, we pronounce in Kubernetes very funny. Um, no, I'm not, because there are more funnier ways to pronounce Kubernetes. Um, my favorite probably is, would be Kubernetes um, and uh, Kubernetes. I don't know, I just like, I like, I like how it sounds. So essentially, this is, um, this is how, how you need to, some people are saying Kate 8 s Kate Skates. I don't know, I would, for some reason I don't like how it sounds. Anyway, another question. So Kubernetes. How many of you running any type, not any, stateless, like web services, web servers on Kubernetes today in production? Do we have any people? Oh, keep your hands, keep your hands, because I have a follow-up question. How many of you think it's a good idea? And the answer is, I, I'm pretty sure it's a good idea, right? Because um, the overall infrastructure uh, and overall the Kubernetes idea was, was there to create Hey, we just um, we just uh, we don't need to care about the servers anymore. Our application is stateless. We don't need to worry about like if it goes down, Kubernetes will bring this up, and we will be good to go. Now, how many of you are running stateful applications? Any type of database, any type of like maybe messaging system. Uh, okay, keep your hands. Not many. You see, the, the, and I see there's a different different people now raise hands. Who thinks it's a good idea? It's still, still uh, not so many of us, but I think it's, it is, it is okay idea, right? So a couple of years ago, the, we have this like a very interesting conversations in Twitter when the people like, uh, I, will, I will bring back Kelsey Hightower, we're talking about stateful workloads, but why we think it is difficult. So it is tricky. You cannot just uh, take the existing application, put this in a container, and you can say, hey, it's a cloud native now, right? So you cannot do this. So Kafka, for example, um, was designed um, to be very opinionated in order how the things needs to be configured. So Kafka designed to be resilient for multiple things. Uh, in, in related to you know, how, the, how the, the, the memory would be handled, how the disk will be handled. And Kafka was designed in the, in the era where the containers were still kind of like a toys. Um, however, now, all of a sudden, we need to run this in containers, uh, and we have a different set of requirements. For example, our disk now may be not directly attached to our nodes, so we need to make sure that our application can work with this type of setup. So next thing is the network. Um, so the, in order to form the cluster, the latency between nodes needs to be a minimum in order to provide a high level of consistency. This type of thing we need to translate into Kubernetes world and how this, you know, what, what does it mean in Kubernetes world and how the Kafka will be working there. So um, apart from the being uh, providing this like a tricky things in order to, to configure cluster, we also need to provide external access. For, for external access, we need to obey rules uh, how things need to be handled in Kubernetes world. It needs to be handled uh, with the ingress controller if we need to provide external access, but Kafka protocol runs on the lower level of, uh, um, it's low, uh, level, uh, on TCP level versus uh, the ingress that works on HTTP level. So in this case, uh, ingress controller will not work. We need to use load balancers. However, we can run our Kubernetes cluster not only on-premise, but we can run this in cloud because multiple cloud providers allows us to run the Kubernetes in cloud. We need to understand how we can deal with differences between load balancers across multiple cloud providers. Now, um, things around storage that I already mentioned. Um, uh, Persistent uh, persistent storage in Kubernetes 
went through very interesting times. Right now at Mature, there's different providers that allows you to uh, bring different types of storages. You can get uh, fast storage, you can get slow storage. Um, right now, it is kind of, uh, it's possible. However, the, 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 the hard part is to teach software to understand this kind of uh, uh, notion that, you know, the disk will might disappear all of a sudden. And, like, the, is there any guarantees that this disk will be reattached to the same pod because Kafka expects the certain directory structure in order to have these things there? And uh, one of the important things, this is why it's so important, this is why I put this on number four, right? Uh, we always think about security as a, some sort of like a day two thing. But uh, uh, it's good that we didn't have any like uh, news or new, new post on Hacker News when the Kafka was hacked because it was exposed outside the world through uh, unsecured channel and things like that. Um, because again, it's tricky. <laughs> it's tricky because the providing external access to Kafka is not uh, <laughs> is not something that uh, you, you can you can do out of the dogs without without some magic. So yes, security is important. Like providing this um, TLS uh, encryption between uh, between nodes or within brokers, providing external access so clients can connect through a secure channel. How you can rotate your certificates in order to provide this uh, you know the hardening your infrastructure and so far and so on. <laughs> and um, Upgrading your stuff is also important, like how you would upgrade, what's the, uh, because you need to have also knowledge because Kafka has a certain path to upgrading. It's not difficult, but it is certain things needs to be done. And this is one of the tweets that I, I brought up from the past one, the Kelsey Hightower, where he was talking about things like, okay, um, yeah, essentially Kubernetes supports state workloads, I don't. Um, and it's fair enough because it is required very important thing. He says, I lack of expertise to manage production configuration of Kafka. So by I, he means just like a Kelsey Hightower as a person. Not like he cannot gain this, this experience, but he doesn't have it because it will require you to understand how this database works, how this Kafka thing works. So it requires the knowledge of this site reliability engineer, a Kafka engineer or whatever. So, and this is where uh, Gwen, uh, how many of you heard about the Gwen Shapira? How many of you heard about Kelsey Hightower? Okay, so Kelsey, uh, Gwen Shapiro is the Kelsey Hightower in the Kafka world. So if you're not following her, just go to follow. She's amazing. She's author of this uh, definitive guide for Kafka, probably one book about Kafka that you ever need. And she is talking, she's right now working in our, uh, like a cloud native uh, Kafka, and she's a managing uh, team of engineers. Now, and she brings some of the things around Kubernetes and Kafka and how it needs to work with the with storage and uh, so far and so on. She has this experience, so this is why she working at the team to bring this into the cloud. So importance of the experience of the person who know how to run this Kafka is important, not necessarily in Kafka, in any stateful workload, because we'll see why. But yeah, so like Victor, why you, uh, you keep uh, bringing this drama here over and over? Uh, the, the talk was supposed to be, doesn't have to be hard way, but let's, let me walk you through things that needs to be handled in order to you to appreciate the, uh, the solution, basically. Okay, so let's take a look uh, on the demo. And for this demo, I will be, uh, will be using Twitter, as I mentioned. So, um, for this demo, well, in order to, to, to do this stuff, um, Tweet with hashtag DevNexus. Uh, tag me there. You can send the f f photos. You cannot send if you don't want to send photos, whatever. Uh, but this demo will be uh, doing some, some stuff. And uh, in this demo, my demo is, uh, let me check if everything is working. Nothing is working because internet. Um, let me get here. And to uh, do. -do, -do. But let me first show you a couple things. So I have my uh, Kubernetes cluster deployed in uh, GKE and my uh, Kubernetes cluster already, uh, I already you know, deployed Kafka cluster. Um, I could do this deployment uh, during my talk, but like I just don't want us to sit here and just watch the running later. So I did this up front so I can uh, go to the fun part. So um, let me see what do we have here. 
So, uh, so let's get the, let's see the pods. So in this case, I have a Kafka cluster that has a uh, three brokers. In this particular case, I have a three uh, Kafka brokers. I have a three zookeepers, um, and these things are kind of like a configured by default. So with the with the thing that I deployed, and I will be talking about deployment in a couple more minutes, uh, we're providing certain like defaults that would be you know sane enough so you can start uh, more or less um, realistic uh, deployment. Now, with this, um, um, what we're going to be doing? I have this uh, small, uh, small stream processing uh, application called KSQL DB. How, how many of you heard about uh, KSQL before this presentation? We have a few of those. So essentially, um, Kafka is a distributed streaming platform, meaning that it allows you to bring data in and take data out. And in order to make it um, to do something with this data, you need to have a stream processing framework. Um, so KSQL DB is the framework that allows you to write your stream processing uh, things using language very similar to SQL. There are different things that you can do. You can write Java applications using Kafka streams. There's Aka streams. There's uh, multiple different frameworks that uh, can operate. But in this particular case, I don't want to write anything. I just want to do um, just write my queries and, and so far and so on. So. Um, because um, like I was running this demo for a while, so this demo is actually uh, capturing some of the tweets in the real time, and the tweets will need to have uh, uh, like certain Twitter handles and that might have uh, certain hashtags. So in this particular case, if I will, if I will show you this, the, 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 the connect Twitter connect. It's a very secret. It's a very secret uh, connector. So in this particular case, it listens for everything that you tweet about Apache Kafka, about DevNexus, about myself, um, and KSQL and Kubernetes. So if you will do this, we probably will capture um, these uh, tweets in our application. Um, and the Kafka, uh, for, 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 um, for sometimes uh, people get confused and, hey, it's a messaging system, and uh, like, what's the difference between JMS? The only one thing that matters for this demo is that even that message was first time consumed from Kafka, it will not disappear. So Kafka remembers things. And in order for me to retrieve this pep, I just resetting this offset. So meaning that I will start from the very beginning when I started my demo. So if I will do. So for example, I want to see how many people were tweeting about my sessions, and uh, this is how I can do this. And as you can see, I'm using just uh, select, uh, select, uh, select query. And uh, on the very end, I'm also putting this kind of things called emit changes. What does it mean? I got some of the, the tweets from the past. And if some of you will tweet just right now, you will see uh, this tweet here. So let me show you. So originally I'm from Russia. So this is why I will do whatever Russian people doing. It's creating a bunch of fake Twitter accounts on the internet and tweet about this, right? <laughs> so because you guys don't want to cooperate, you know, expect some, uh, how it's called, Russian collusion in, in DevNexus, yeah. So I do have my, um, my companion. Uh, this small Twitter account called Friends Kafka. And I'll say, hey, uh, my boy, uh, JUMSA, is on the stage of the Nexus talking about, so let's do, we'll try to get all. Uh, uh, all possible uh, hashtags Kubernetes IO. No? Yeah, Kubernetes IO. And Apache Kafka. Right? And let's do something because we're in 2020. We cannot send the messages without emojis. <laughs> all right? Okay, let's see how it goes. I just tweeted. And uh, so the tweet goes to, to internet, hey. And see, the cool thing about this is the emoji is also working. So you, I will keep this running if you want to you know, also submit some of the tweets and uh, talk about the, how awesome this presentation. But again, 
right now, uh, I have uh, this like streaming platform running. I have a connector that listens all the Twitter tweets, and this uh, the Twitter uh, connector would put everything in my Kafka cluster uh, that contains uh, three brokers. Now, um, I'm going to be showing you how I can do things like um, you know scaling up, scaling down. So you will see that uh, the stream processing bit will not be affected by certain like uh, operational changes in our cluster. So. This is the premise. You can continue to it. I will still uh, using a couple more, um, couple more slides. Um, briefly talk about Kubernetes. Only things that uh, uh, will be required for this demo. So um, I consider Kubernetes uh, today as a modern distributed operating system. So your operating system, very similar to operating system that you run in your laptop, but this operating system runs inside your data center. So uh, instead of running small apps, you're running these things um, called uh, uh, pods. We're going to be talking about pods in a moment. And also, this distributed operating system provides API, so I can communicate through different clients, this API available uh, externally. Also, I can have internal, so I can deploy my applications inside the Kubernetes, and they also can talk to this distributed uh, operating system. So let me talk a little bit about the uh, components that are important for this particular case. Um, so first of all, minimum unit of deployment is a pod. I think that this is a picture is perfect because it represents a couple interesting points here. First of all, um, it includes collection of containers. And as you, as you can see here, if you look on this one, it's actually few, uh, few liquids, whatever. How many of you heard about Tide Pod Challenge? How many of you participated? Good stuff. Um, so essentially, yes, a couple things here. And uh, this pod includes two, two containers. Um, so those two containers actually sharing some of the things. So they're sharing namespace, they're sharing some network, they're sharing the local storage. Um, and this is important because it allows you to um, um, make your up, uh, software that was not designed to be cloud native uh, by you know, introducing some of these kind of like adapters. Um, you can make this uh, application more cloud native. For example, Kafka has, uh, because it's a Java application, has uh, the monitoring uh, endpoints that expose JMS. Oh, sorry, JMX. And, um, but uh, in the cloud native world, uh, we're using what? What we're using for monitoring in cloud native world? We're using Prometheus. And the Prometheus maybe don't know anything about Kafka and don't know anything about the JMS. So this is why there is a um, small adapter that runs inside the pod where my you know, Kafka running. There's a sidecar that exposes metrics to the format that Promethe uh, Prometheus understands. It's called like a Kafka, uh, like JMS, Prometheus uh, JMS exporter. So essentially, um, Kafka don't know anything about Prometheus. Prometheus doesn't know anything about Kafka, but sidecar container that runs inside on the same pod that my Kafka um, the binary is running allows me to um, allows me to expose it. And because they're running on the same on the same pod, I don't need to come up with some like a sophisticated network mechanism in order to communicate. They communicate between two pods inside one uh, two containers inside one pod. They communicate to each other through localhost. Next thing. Uh, uh, we, we're talking about uh, a system that requires persistency, so Kubernetes provides us with this uh, concept of persistent volume. Persistent volume, um, it is essentially a disk that you can request. So in order to request this, you need to submit persistent volume claim. Your system administrator goes there and configure your network array and saying, hey, do I have uh, two types of uh, the disks? I have a fast disk and slow disk. Fast disk, disk is more expensive, slow disk is cheaper. So this is how system administrator defines the storage classes. So storage classes, this is what you as a developer need to choose when you're creating this persistent volume claim. Persistent volume claim is something that like you have this uh, application that you fill in and go into Kubernetes cluster and say, hey, I need this five terabytes of fast storage. This is your persistent volume claim. So um, our developer, Ninja, a developer asking for um, for storage, some application requires storage, so this guy will ask this, submit this persistent volume claim, specifying that he wants to have a fast storage, and the storage class would be fast. 
And uh, the next, uh, next uh, Kubernetes will be provisioning this um, persistent volume to the pod where this application will be running. In our particular case, um, it would be my application that runs this like eSQL DB. Um, on the low level, what is going on? On the low level, um, the actual, um, whatever the disk provider, it can be um, a network attached storage or it can be uh, some, some local attached storage, it depends how you configure. This is something that uh, your uh, Kubernetes uh, administrator configures or your cloud provider configures. So um, Kubernetes controller, um, has um, uh, the ways how he can interact with this storage and there is a kind of um, defined API and protocols how we can do that. Um, the ind individual Kubernetes nodes, that uh, node in this worker pool that will be you know, hosting your pods um, will have a connection to this uh, storage system and um, usually this storage system will be mounted into this uh, some water leap folder where uh, this Kubelet, uh, this small application that uh, runs inside on like physical node or some of the virtual node will be responsible for proxying these requests and making sure that actual physical storage will be available. Again, how we can deploy Kafka. Now we're going into an interesting point. In order to deploy Kafka, you need to know a lot of things, right? You need to know a lot of things around storage and a lot of things around network, a, a lot of things around um, how to configure the stuff and so far and so on. Now, uh, one of the things that uh, we quickly realized that we, uh, when we work with uh, customers, uh, when the, the company just uh, was started, um, we have experience to run Kafka. However, um, human cloning technology was forbidden, so we couldn't like clone people, so we can send the people and help to all our customers. So we need to come up something with this. So being a software developers, we start thinking how we can automate this process. So the first attempt, usually it's kind of sort of like, okay, so let's bring the tons of um, shell scripts that allows to, you know, customers to run this. Uh, and, uh, but this stuff won't fly very long because we start building our own um, kind of like cloud service and we also realize that it, it needs to be something more. From the, the very early days of Confluent Cloud, we uh, use Kubernetes as a platform to run our Confluent Cloud stuff. So we start building this um, internal uh, kind of like a modules that extend Kubernetes in order to uh, make Kafka more native or like operate Kafka more natively uh, on Kubernetes. So we start this process of, uh, you know, make this Kafka more cloud native. Now, over the time, um, essentially, we, we start extracting this knowledge from the brains of people who know how to run this Kafka in, uh, at large scale into software piece. This is how this concept of operator came into play. It's a general uh, term for any type of software that knows how to run very complex uh, systems. Um, so this, is, this concept was popularized by CoreOS and now, um, now it's a part of Red Hat. And the operator essentially, it is something that uh, we called, uh, we're gonna be talking about this. Yeah, so essentially it's an extension of uh, Kubernetes brains. So uh, remember when I always said that Kubernetes is a, a modern distributed uh, uh, operating system. An operating system might have some user space application and some system application. So custom resource controller is a system a software that sits inside uh, your Kubernetes cluster and doing something that extends that provides new capabilities to your Kubernetes cluster. In this particular case, we want to teach our Kubernetes natively understand Kafka. We don't want to go through the process every time when we deploy cluster and saying, hey, we need a persistent volumes, we need to have uh, stateful sets, we need to have uh, services, we need to have uh, load balancers. We only want to have think, hey, I want to have a Kafka cluster. So uh, let me show you how this uh, look like uh, from perspective of, uh, from perspective of uh, human, um, so I'm trying to avoid the word operator because in this particular case it would be even more confusing. So someone is actually tweeting. Keep keep them coming. Keep them coming. Now, let me do this. Uh, 
operator, I will switch to this namespace. So first of all, um, how we operate, how we interact with any resources that we have in Kubernetes. So we have the commands like get pods, because pods are resources, and we see all the pods that deploys here, deployed here. Um, we can use a things like uh, k get deployment. Deployment, it's another resource, and we have a certain resources here. We can get k get persistent volume claims. And we see what kind of persistent volume claims and what kind of persistent uh, volumes available for us. We see all this kind of stuff. But uh, what operator does, like in specifically this confluent operator, I can do k get Kafka. And it has some, some Kafka here. So let's, let's take a look closely what we have in this uh, Kafka guy. So what we have here is that it's a new kind of resources that are available in, in Kubernetes. And there's a couple things that um, would be fully dedicated to the things that are related to Kafka. So th there's nothing here we're saying, hey, we need to use um, like certain like persistent volume claims and things like that. We know that there should be something around uh, where's the storage. We say, hey, storage, we want to have for each, uh, for, for, for each um, Kafka broker, we want to have a 10 gigabytes of, uh, of space. Um, we also want to have number, where is it? Um, we can place, specify placement. We can say, hey, we're deploying this in one zone or multiple zones. So what, 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 what have we? And um, we can configure security just with one switch saying, hey, enable TLS. And after that, all this security uh, like certificates will be generated and provisioned to the, to the nodes. Um, monitoring uh, reporter will be enabled just by you know, switching this uh, thing on. And one of the things I'm actually looking is to how many nodes we have here, sorry. Uh, two, 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 two. Yeah, replicas. So the things that have some three nodes, and after that, operator will go ahead and do this. So since it's a native um, resource, so I can also go and modify this. And I'm not necessarily need to specify how I want to scale this out, right? Because I know that when I specify something in my Kubernetes and here I want to scale this out, um, I don't need to say what exactly needs to. Kubernetes makes things done for me. So uh, just uh, don't do this in production because because you, know, you don't want to go directly and edit something in your production cluster. Um, so I'm going here and saying replicas number four. Oops. Click save. And save. I'm do quit. And after that, I'll just do watch. And let's see what will happen. So uh, only thing that I change here, I just change number of replicas. And because I have this brains that's sitting inside my cluster called custom resource controller that will be responsible for watching changes that happen on this Kafka cluster resource, it knows, okay, someone just trigger, uh, change the number of replicas. Now I know exactly what I need to do. And after that, it goes here and start bringing more nodes, uh, figuring out how this node will be joining uh, another member of the cluster. Um, we still have our application connected here. So our application still be working without any problems. You can go and tweet, and in this case, you will see um, if, uh, if we have something. Uh, let me do things. Let me see. Um, we have DevNexus. Um, let's see all the tweets from DevNexus. Uh, and uh, because I have a tough crowd today, probably it's the last session and people already struggling to, to concentrate. Hey. Something, something is here. So maybe it will, other people will be tweeting. Oh, okay, I know what's the problem. So when I, um, this is every time when you're changing the font in the, uh, in the console uh, application, it cannot figure out. So let me quickly update this. Set, set, set. Yep, I set of set. And uh, let's see if we have a. Pretty, a pretty view of our table. Supposed to be pretty. Um, nope. Otherwise, like uh, doing the, the console, uh, the ASCII art is is difficult. Um, so we will see how it goes. Now, 
next thing is uh, let me see if uh, something is actually is going on here. For that matter, I will be using this small tool that um, is a part of our like deployment, uh, is a part of our platform called the Control Center. And now it shows me I have a four brokers, and it shows me all the brokers are um, uh, alive. And uh, one of the, this is new broker that we get didn't get enough um, like requests for now. So everything works fine. Everything uh, works uh, works great. So we will see. We'll see how it goes. It has a KSQL server, so far and so on. Yeah. So the custom uh, controller will be responsible for uh, low-level things. Um, think about this: uh, the custom resource controller defines the domain-specific logic for particular um, for particular domain. In our case, Kafka. In our case, uh, like Zookeeper. I, I will show some other components in uh, in a few seconds. So. Think about this as kind of like you're defining like a higher uh, higher level language for your like assembly language, where this like assembly language is our persistent volume claims and uh, 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 stateful sets and so forth and so on. So the way how it works internally. So we have um, uh, the Kubernetes cluster stuff is deployed there. Um, they, this is a Kubernetes API server. This is where we're interacting with using command line, we're using Helm charts, we can using some other things like a Java client I showed earlier today, or like a Kotlin client. Now, once we interact in this, we might define certain resources. We're not, we're not telling Kubernetes what to do, we're telling what we want, uh, we want to see in the world. So that we want to see the state of the world, we want to have four Kafka brokers. So we submit this call, and the uh, custom resource controller will be responsible uh, for, for materializing uh, certain uh, things. So some of the components uh, require to be uh, more specific. For example, to run Zookeeper, it requires Zookeeper controller. Um, if you're running Kafka, it requires Kafka controller. And uh, for other, for rest of the components, like we have them, um, um, like um, the connect, like a key SQL DB and other things, we have this generic thing called persistent uh, physical stateful cluster. So let me let me show you quickly. So if I'm do uh, things here, Michael Baldwin, where's my yeah this is guy. So if I do get physical stateful cluster, so in this case, physical stateful cluster again extension of Kubernetes API. I do have only things that. Um, Real, uh, that I care about. Uh, get uh, phys um, um, uh, custom custom resource definitions, yeah, CRDs. So in this case, I'll see there's Kafka clusters, physical stateful clusters, and Zookeeper clusters. So operator pattern is the way how the people will be deploying complex software these days. So there, there are operators, if you, if, you, if you choose like your database, there's probably some operator for your database already in, in Kubernetes. Because people um, who have experience of running this kind of workloads uh, in production, they know how to run stuff and they need to put this knowledge into the software um, because again, cloning is, is something that um, is illegal right now. Usually joke, when I said it twice, it sounds twice funnier, but like not this time. Tough crowd, I understand. Maybe not enough coffee. Okay. The, the way how we deploy in these workloads, uh, like I uh, mentioned in earlier today, Docker uh, or like any type of container images, uh, Docker is just because they have a pretty, pretty picture, but essentially, um, it's called like a open container specification uh, c c compatible image will be successfully executed in, in Kubernetes. This is where we're putting our software. So our software would be container images. Um, if you've been at my session earlier today, I was talking about how I hate YAML. Um, and uh, unfortunately, this is something that we need to live with. Um, so Helm is a uh, templating engine that generates, uh, allows you to uh, template out certain thing, bits of your deployment. Um, we still use this Helm because it's a kind of sort of standard in Kubernetes world. So you're defining, you're declaring how your software needs to be deployed. And even, even for, uh, for custom resources, we're also templating out using Helm. And after that, uh, stuff can be deployed. Even though this, uh, there are multiple clouds, multiple different implementations of um, 
uh, or like a, there's one Kubernetes uh, code base, but different providers might have their own um, kind of bits and uh, bits of uh, of the software that allows them to perform certain tasks. Um, another uh, uh, analogy with the uh, distributed uh, modern operating system is that, like, if you remember Linux, uh, say maybe 15 years ago. Um, Linux distribution, there was a variety of different Linux distributions. Some of them were nicer, some of them have good UI, some of them good, uh, don't have UI, but they have a good capability to run the server. Now we're kind of more or less settled with Linux distributions. Now we have a multiple Kubernetes distributions, right? Some of them are good, some of them have a nice UI, some of them uh, came from like uh, the very serious vendors and, and so far and so on. So now we have like, OpenShift, we have a BTS, we have a, um, a Google, uh, Anthos, which is kind of like a Google um, a Google Cloud platform that you can run on your or, or, on your on your infrastructure. So essentially, there's multiple places. Even though you can you can say, yeah, what about this promise? Uh, build one uh, once and run everywhere. Yes, but <laughs> you need to also put some of the um, like. Uh, Things. Uh, if we deploy in GCP, we need to use a specific to GCP provisioner to talk to GCP specific storage subsystems, so far and so on. So we handle this um, on our side, so we know how to deal with this multiple cloud environment, and our operator knows when we say, "Hey, we run in GCP," it will be correct, um, correct uh, thing. But uh, again, there there was a um, Helm chart. How many of you? Have ever tried to use like a CP Helm charts, maybe? Anyone? Or at least you know about the existence of this. I apologize for that. I was responsible for this repository as well. Uh, no, it, it was a good one. It just like gives you one particular thing. It gives you a way how you can install Kafka, period. So it's your day one thing. It doesn't give you any day two stuff. Like it, it, not, it doesn't give you ways how you can easily upgrade. It doesn't give you ways how you can enable security. And so, um, yeah, but this is how you will deploy with the Helm, um, and you also need to, um, this diagram actually changed because Helm 3 doesn't require Tiller anymore, so this stuff um, not going to happen anymore. I actually broke down this in the in the whiteboarding diagram if you want to uh, watch this, this video, it's, uh, I think it was pretty cool. But again, like with the Helm charts, it's just a temp template. Uh, so, how to do how to do rolling upgrades? Yes, stateful set provides you the way how you can specify order. But uh, this is not going to apply with systems like Kafka because there are certain um, um, there are certain rules how you need to perform things like upgrades. So let me see if I have this. Um, yeah, for example, how I can do rolling upgrades. So there's certain rules. Uh, in order to the people who raise their hands, uh, who knows uh, how to run the Kafka, they know this, this this stuff, because they probably doing this on the, um, the day to day part of the job. So when you need to upgrade, just start stop the one of the brokers. You need to wait until uh, the partition uh, reassignment uh, will, will will happen. So some of the replicas will be promoted to. Um, to, uh, to leaders, and after that you can start upgrading broker, and after that you can wait until under-replicated partition numbers will go down. So, it is not a complicated process, but it requires you to deep knowledge of how you would, uh, for example, how you would monitor under-replicated partitions, right? So there is metric available, but like in order to get this metric, you need to understand how you can read this from GMS, or like export to the system where you can monitor it, or use control center, or whatnot. Um, how we can wait until partition leader design will happen. Yes, there's API that allows you to have the triggers. There are, um, I guess, plenty of tools uh, 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 all over internet that you know, provide you the way to do Kafka rolling. We start, the, one of the popular was from, I guess, from Yelp, uh, like Python scripts. Anyone was using this one? Heard? No? Yeah. So it is not a complicated process. So, but operator makes it it's already built in. Here's another thing. 
you cannot just like kill into, uh, like an arbitrary broker in this case. You need to kill specific broker, or I would just say you need to kill specific broker last. So there's a Kafka, uh, there's a controller, there's one of the broker that has a little more responsibility than other brokers, and the controller actually has a full replica of uh, of uh, um, the topology of the topics and uh, in memory. Uh, this information can be retrieved from uh, from Zookeeper, um, but it will take some, some time. So process of your restart will significantly uh, slow down if you will start killing controller uh, first, because after that you need to elect the controller. So that's why usually the controller goes um, goes less. And the thing I just mentioned it's important from perspective. Uh, people who done any Kafka rolling restart, they know these things. Kubernetes doesn't know this, and uh, you cannot just simply use this uh, uh, standard policies to do rolling restarts, rolling upgrades. <coughs> knowledge of SRE, knowledge of the human operator is important. And this is how we uh, go into this conversation. Um, so, in terms of scalability, so currently we're working on providing the ways you saw. If I go here and go to my brokers, even though I just add one broker, I didn't run the procedure of uh, partition reassignment. So in this case, right now, I didn't create in any new topics. So existing topics still will conti continue to work um, to run on uh, on the previous brokers. So in order to fully embrace this kind of like a scalability aspect, I need to also automate process of like auto balancing my cluster. This is something that tools like cruise control from LinkedIn can, can do for you. Does anyone use the cruise control from LinkedIn? If you, if you, if you don't, you should. Uh, cruise control is awesome. It allows you kind of like uh, in automatic, uh, like operate your Kafka on autopilot. It, 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 it can do um, some of the um, load balancing of the Kafka brokers. So this is something that we're also working in order to support this, this kind of capability. But, uh, right now, it needs to be done. Um, needs to be done manually. Um, so we need to figure out the, the balancing plan. So there is a command that allows you to get the partition uh, partition assignment. Uh, you can change this uh, partitions, and after that, you need to upload this, and after that, Kafka will make it happen. Right now, this is manual process. It needs to be done in order to make this fully cloud native. Um, and always, like, uh, you don't want to do this rebalancing in situation where you have a high load and your Kafka is get hammered by multiple, like uh, millions of millions of messages. So monitoring of resources and figuring out the balance plan in order not to kill your Kafka cluster uh, is also important. Well, uh, I, I, I talk, uh, talk a lot about things. One of the things that I talked uh, earlier today um, is how to replace this middleman, um, a middleman in order this uh, the Helm chart because Helm has certain flaws. Um, if you will follow me, I will post a video from my previous talk. You can watch this if you missed this. Um, I hope it was a good one. Um, it was a joke again, and no one is laughing. So in this case, I feel myself weird. So let me sh quickly show you. Um, if I want to. I uh, use like a general programming language to write my deployments in this particular case. Like my DSL can understand uh, how to work with this custom resource definition. So instead of me going in and manually creating all these components, I can just go directly and talk to this custom resource in this particular case. Uh, let me see if I can show it. Um, I always know that like I'm building this and uh, I have a types and I have a type, type check stuff. So it looks exactly like the thing I showed you earlier. If I will do k get Kafka with YAML. But it's much better because it has compile time checks, it has a time checks. I don't need to have this again, like documentation open on the either screen so I know what kind of things to type. So sounds like this. All right, so um, I guess this is it. So um, it is awesome. It's not super. Uh, it's not super difficult. If you uh, let me actually give you a link to this demo, so you can run yourself and you can get idea that it's not uh, not something. Uh, go into dev, dev Nexus. Um, 
So you can grab my demo, so um, you will have a structure like this, you have configuration files. Um, if you have a Google Cloud uh, account, I use Google Cloud personally because I like their Kubernetes experience, it's more or less vanilla, I don't need to um, do multiple things in order to have this kind of like uh, the, the vendor specific features, so I, I, I like to use uh, Google Cloud myself. Um, if you have uh, Google Cloud tools installed, you just need to run two commands, uh, make, create cluster, and make demo. So in this case, it's deploy all the stuff. Um, in this demo, what you will get, uh, you will get um, the configuration, how you configure connectors. In this particular case, I have my uh, Twitter connector and how we, can, uh, how we can run the stuff, like how we can get Twitter connector. Um, there is a, a demo how you can deploy simple uh, console application and how it needs to interact with this uh, Kafka cluster. Um, also, you will get the control center, so you can have a more or less nice UI. If we go and say, where is it, uh, Twitter. So let's go with Twitter. There's someone is tweeting. If I can go here and see any messages that come in here, uh, hopefully someone is tweeting. You guys keep tweeting, no? Let's see, let me let me check. I know how to check this, right? Because I have a select, uh, uh, and I will do myself. I'll check myself. Did you ever Google, Google yourself? I do it all the time, but I don't need to Google because I have uh, my Kafka. This is how I read my Twitter, by the way. Um, I just use my Kafka cluster on Kubernetes, and um, no one is writing. Come on, we still have a few few minutes. You can go and tweet about this. Do it. Do it. It's good stuff. Do it. It's becoming awkward, I know. Do it. I can do this all day. Anyways, so, um, yeah. So, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out, uh, like, not the, maybe some like fitness advice or Kafka advice. So, this is where I'm kind of considering myself an expert. Um, tweet me. How many of you have an email? Email. <laughs> Write me an email. Uh, it's a Victor at Confluent. And if you have any questions around the, the Kafka, Kafka streams, connect, we have a Slack. Um, if you have not enough Slacks in your Slack, Slack chats in your Slack, you can you know join like 10 or 11 Slack. Um, this is our Kafka community. We have some engineers from from Confluent, engineers from other companies who um, you know chatting about certain things, like uh, Kafka Streams, very active, uh, KSQL TV, very active community. Um, I'm trying to answer some of the Kubernetes related questions in Kubernetes chat. So, thank you very much for your time. I'm available for enhanced interrogation if you have any questions. Uh, and again, thank you that uh, you spent this hour with me. I enjoyed this. I don't know if you did, because I probably never know, because no one was tweeting. Thank you.